Well, hello, ladies and gentlemen and fellow advocates of our co-created food future. Welcome to Cultivating Resilience, exploring strategies for a thriving food future. I'm humbled to be here today, united by a common passion for food sovereignty and agricultural resilience. We have the power to sow the seeds of change and to tend the soil of our community, ensuring that every person has access to healthy, nutritious, and locally sourced foods. Food sovereignty isn't a fad. It's a mission and a fundamental human right. Our food system should be determined by those who produce, distribute, and consume the food. Sovereignty is about empowering communities to control their food sources from the, and, and take back the control from the constraints of a globalized and corporatized industrial food complex. Resilience, on the other hand, is the life force that courses through any system, the strength that enables it to weather the storms and thrive in adversity. Resilience means adapting, evolving, and coming back stronger after every challenge. It, it, it's the determination to find solutions, to cultivate innovation, and to ensure that our food future is unbreakable. Our discussion today will explore the strategies, the stories, and the spirit of resilience in our community. We aim to understand the challenges we face from climate change to food insecurity and find ways to overcome them together. As we delve into the insights and experiences of our panelists, let us remember that we are not bystanders and spectators, but we are active participants in the health of our, in the future of our health and the future of our food choices, as well as active participants in the health and well-being of the San Luis Valley and all of its inhabitants. Your questions, your ideas, and your choices will all determine the, and, and contribute to the fertile ground from which our solutions will emerge. Let's commit to a future where every child knows the taste of a freshly harvested tomato, where every family has access to nutritious foods that they wanna eat, and where our producers can rest easy at night knowing that the reciprocal relationship they have with their community is supportive and strong. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for joining this discussion this morning because together we can cultivate resilience and together we can shape the food and agricultural systems that we're proud to be a part of. So thank you. So I'm Jay Sanders and um, I am the project coordinator for the Community Food and Agricultural Assessment with the San Luis Valley Local Foods Coalition. I'm also the director of the San Luis Valley Seed Exchange that takes place in the spring here at Joyful Journey Hot Springs. And I want to, um, I got my papers out of order. <laughs> or did I throw one away altogether? Right, okay, and I want to give you some a uh, little overview of, of what we're going to talk about today. So back in April of 2022, the Local Foods Coalition initiated a year-long project, which was the San Luis Valley Food and Agricultural Assessment, with the ultimate goal of producing a valley-wide and community-driven action plan based on the findings. One aim of the assessment was exploring the successes and the challenges encountered by our food producers, food businesses, and community members. Additionally, we sought their insights and ideas for a thriving food future. We conducted a comprehensive outreach across all six counties in the SLV by hosting listening summits, conducting a photo voice project, and administering three distinct surveys to the aforementioned groups. Today, our focus will be on the prioritized goals that emerged from these surveys. And now I'm gonna introduce our panelists. Starting right here is um, 
and exhibiting an excellent model of what regenerative farming can look like. Located in Hooper is our potato princess of Jones or Farms Organics and the new owner of the Hooper Junction, Sarah Jones. <laughs> Next, she's a co-manager of the San Juan Ranch, which produces organic grass-fed and finished beef and prides itself in training the next generation of ranchers right here in Sawatch County, Noelle McDonahue. Next, um, our next panelist was born and raised in Colorado agriculture with deep roots in soil and water conservation and is now the the district manager for the Seno Center and Rio Grande Conservation Districts, Matea Friel. And a man most of you know due to his multiple appearances at the Crestone Energy Fair and the mastermind behind the Valley Roots Food Hub and Dune Valley Distilleries, both located in Moscow, is Nick Chambers. I'm glad I found my bio. What? I'm glad I found the bio. Yeah. <laughs> in the wrong order. So one aspect of the data we gathered, like I said, was through three surveys. One was for producers, which is farmers and ranchers. One was for food businesses, and the other was for community members. They each had their own set of unique questions, but they also had some of the same questions. And one of those questions was, which food and agricultural system goals are most important to the San Luis Valley community. They were given 15 choices and asked to pick their top three. And so what emerged from those goals that are these eight, um, eight statements on this poster below, and these eight goals are what we're gonna talk about here today. So um, the first one, this was shared by all three survey takers and by that I mean the groups we surveyed, and it was to invest in a thriving local food and farm economy. And um, what this tells us is that we need to do more work to support our local producers and more work to get local food available to the people that want it. And as much as I really like that, that, that goal, it's a little vague and broad and I don't know how to get into it. <laughs> so the next one we are gonna get into is that people, the other, Thing that emerged by all, it was the top priority by all three of those groups, was to encourage and support youth farming and ranching programs. And so that's what I want to have you guys talk about. And I think, I'm, I know that there's 4-H and FFA, but I really want to focus on the 20 and 30-something year olds that know they want to get into agriculture, know they want to farm or ranch, and talk about the programs and initiatives that can support them. So... Do any of you have any suggestions, advice, um, you know, know what it is these young producers need? What are the challenges? What are their barriers? And what can we do to support them? Okay. Um, hi, everyone. Um, so I did not grow up in an agricultural background. I'm actually from... 30 minutes north of New York City, um, outside of Manhattan, and uh, decided in my mid-20s that farming and ranching and working with livestock is what I wanted to do, but I didn't know how to go about it, given that I had um, no path to take necessarily to find myself in an agricultural place. Um, I actually applied, there's a new agrarian program through the Quivira Coalition, uh, and they're down in uh, Santa Fe, New Mexico. Their whole goal is to connect people, mostly people who don't have an agricultural background, to ranchers and farmers within the Intermountain West, um, and create a mentorship program, essentially, between the two, between young people, new agrarians, and ranchers who are third, fourth, fifth generation on their land. And that's what brought me here. Um, I work for George Witten and Julie Sullivan at San Juan Ranch. Um, they're located right outside of Sawatch. And a main focus of the program is regenerative ranching and farming. And those are the practices that George and Julie, um, their biggest value and what they've instilled within me as well. Um, I think in the past, since 2020, the mentorship 
has expanded to over 30 sites um, between Montana, Wyoming, uh, Colorado, and New Mexico. And it's a two-year program. Most people do two years, some people just do one, um, but it connects young people to other young people who have passions. It connects um, ranchers and farmers to young people after they graduate the program. Um, and I think it, it also helps with the education piece that um, most people don't come from this background. And I, I really appreciated it. I graduated now uh, almost two years ago from this program. And the people I've met, um, the courses I've been able to take uh, had a profound impact on me as a young person getting into this program. So I don't know if anyone else has anything. <laughs> okay. Yeah, so I'm a fourth generation farmer. So I've had it a little bit easier than a lot of the other young farmers and ranchers coming into the industry. Um, my family has had a lot of succession planning which a lot of people starting out, they don't have the benefit of that. So I think one of the largest barriers that are facing our new producers is the finances. And I think it's a little disheartening and discouraging when a lot of people that are getting into the industry have to start out in debt. So there is a program um, through the FSA, so that's the Farm Service Agency, that can help support and provide loans and financial assistance for these young producers. This is the Beginning Farmers Program. Um, in addition to that, I know a lot of people, when they're getting into it, there's a lot you don't know that you weren't taught through your generations, that your grandpa didn't teach you going out on the farm, that your dad didn't teach you getting in the tractor. Um, so the Colorado um, Farm Bureau has a mentorship program that they partner these young, new farmers and ranchers, even older producers that still want to learn something new with someone a little bit more experienced in whatever field you want to get into, whether it be cattle, whether it be potatoes or corn, um, they'll partner you with one of these producers that kind of has a little bit more experience with it and pass that on to you. So that kind of continues those generations and that kind of acts like our succession planning. Um, so there's, there is a lot out there that a lot of younger farmers and ranchers don't know that are my age trying to get into the industry that didn't have the same background um, as those who are kind of carrying it through the generations. So there's a couple different resources out there, but those are the main barriers is you don't know what you're doing or what, how to get started or what's all involved with it and the finances. And I mean, every farmer out there has had to be in debt at least once in their lives. It's just part of the industry. But we're looking at how we can support our new farmers and how we can bring them out of that and help them through that initial part too. Um, just to add on that a little bit, um, I think for younger people who didn't grow up in agriculture, the thought of ever owning land is kind of a fantasy at this point, um, especially given the challenges of financial backing. Um, I think collaboration is really the greatest thing for young people and I think they have a, a more open mindset to collaborating with other young people, with landowners, um, with ranchers and farmers who are maybe aging out, which is most of our ranchers and farmers, um, to kind of maybe not own the land or own the animals or own the crop, but to um, lease all of those things in order to do the work that they want to do. And I think... Um, there's a lot of potential there within collaboration, not only with products or production, but with um, ideas and getting food to people. I think that's a really big um, goal of young people, um, not just young people, all people, I guess. But I think that um, young people see the need for that and the need for connection and community and maybe some of these barriers can actually be a positive um, in creating new spaces, new ideas, new systems um, without the, maybe the uh, paradigm of owning any of that. Have, have you all um, 
are there any holes that you see that just aren't being filled and what what younger people are needing and there's like no resources for it are, I don't know if you know of that or and I mean I feel like land access is like the big one um, but are there other things that you wish you would have had or you know somebody would have offered some sort of education or I'll just keep going I guess I, I think all people um, transition and succession is kind of a yucky topic for families especially in agricultural settings where um, you're usually working with family members and to add new different people from the outside into that can be really messy um, it's something that uh, myself and uh, Sam my partner who I came out here with uh, are working with George and Julie on um, and it might not be for our succession plan but these are things that they really need to figure out for the future of the ranch um, and there are some new ideas coming out for people who own ranches who are aging out but they want the land to continue being working land they don't want to have to sell out um, and they want it to stay in agriculture. Um, I think that is the whole. There's not a whole lot of support for people to have these conversations about succession, about death, about um, family members that are either on the ranch or not, and, and what to do with all of these puzzle pieces that maybe don't fit together um, fully. That's, I guess, my answer. I don't know if anyone else. Um, so the Valley Roots Food Hub has like over a hundred producers in our network and that's across produce, meat, dairy, value added and uh, it's really exciting to have some of the younger producers in that mix um, utilize us in the way that you know they can stay on the farm or the ranch or in the kitchen and do the work and we can do the marketing and sales and distribution and stuff like that and so that's really one of the value propositions that we try to do is provide that link, provide that help and assistance and get those products out there to the point where some uh, producers have been able to like stop doing a market that's four, six hours away and all the, you know, hauling of produce and packaging and coolers and then bringing back produce that's sat out in the sun for two days and all that type of stuff. So they're pretty happy about that type of mix. Um, and I also want to bring out, you know, it's not just on the farm and on the ranch, but in the kitchens. And uh, shout out to John Young who uh, bought Seth's pizza oven and I know here's somewhere here today, um, you know, and just to see him bucking up and paying the fees and filling out the paperwork and really jumping through the hoops that you got to do to get the food to a public event like this. Um, and it's, it takes a lot. And so I, I really shout out to the people in the kitchens that take the products from the farms and ranches. Um, he was breaking down a whole chuck roast from Matt at the Mercantile, who just broke down the whole cow earlier this week. And, you know, just to see that succession. Um, so I think that's important too. And the other one that's really coming up is the school districts um, and getting the local foods into schools. And that sounds really easy and there's a lot of uh, you know, subsidy and money for buying local, but it's not as easy as it sounds because some of these schools don't even have pots and pans to cook with. And so it's about getting trained people in there that knows how to work with food and knows how to work with whole foods and knows how to work with local whole foods. And that's just not the way it's been in local schools. Um, so we need to reimagine what a school cafeteria is and who's running that and how that works. Do you have something to say about education? Because this is a good segue into value adding. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I um, agree with Nick on all of that too. You know, oftentimes we think of, you know, sort of the farm work of just like r driving the tractors, you know, getting dirty, d putting in the manual labor, but something that we found on our fourth and fifth generation um, potato, organic uh, potato and grain farm is that really the sales and marketing is, you know, 50% plus of the farm, right? Farmers can grow it. They want to grow it. They love to grow it. But without, you know, the Valley Roots Food Hub um, and people like me telling the story, doing the sales and marketing for the farmers, really whatever they planted and grew is worthless. So to Nick's point, you know, if you want to get involved too, um, there's so many opportunities, you know, maybe you're a graphic designer, maybe, you know, you're in sales and marketing, maybe you're a teacher, you work in schools, you're a chef. Um, there's 
there's so many ways to help the farmers other than just, you know, again, working on the farm, driving the tractor um, around. Also, though, if you do want to do the manual labor, you know, aspect, Quivera, as Noel said, is an amazing organization. Um, there's also so many farms that if you have the grit and you're willing and want to learn, they want to pay you and they, they are willing to teach you so much about these, you know, multi-generational farms. Um, we do, you know, not as much, we have one employee, um, not on our, you know, not in our family. He's in his twenties and has been with us for a few years and it's just incredible and such an amazing work ethic. And, you know, we love educating him and, and having him work with us. Um, we also do um, Colorado Proud Week is coming up, and so we get involved with our local schools. They have stone soup, and we get to go in um, and talk to the kids about farming. We also work with Boulder Valley School District, which is a huge school district up in Boulder, and we get to do Meet the Farmer Day, which is really fun, and talk to the kids about what it's like to be a farmer and help answer questions at a really young age. And um, we also started, uh, this will be, I think, our seventh or eighth annual Purple Potato Day. So really educating the kids in the schools that might be sort of scared or grossed out by veggies that are different colors, which is so unfortunate. But like Nick said, some of these schools don't even have kitchens to cook the food. So we encourage and challenge them to try purple mashed potatoes. And then they quickly realize they taste just like normal mashed potatoes, um, but are you know maybe even more delicious and ten times higher in anti um, antioxidants and anthocyanins. So that's been really fun for us to just you know start them young. And there's so many opportunities to do that, even if you're not in ag. Just getting involved in the kids, you know, schools um, and sales and marketing and lots of opportunity out there. Thanks and. Your potatoes are the tastiest potatoes I've ever had. <laughs> They're really great. And I love what you said about um, people, you, you can participate in the local food system and in agriculture because 50% of the work is administ it's administration. And so there's a lot of opportunity there if you don't want to be out in a field. So I like that. And then this is a perfect segue. You're talking, it started to talk about value added, um, that one of the, um, other things that emerged to the top of these shared goals, and this was from producers and food businesses said that they wanted to see, to find ways to add value to our agricultural products through farm and ranch and food entrepreneurs. And so um, I'm wondering if you guys have any ideas about what's in place that people might not know about, about, you know, like whether it's commercial kitchens that people can utilize, if it's like a cottage food act or, or laws that people might be able to produce on a small scale, and then what are the options for producing or processing on a larger scale and adding value? Um, it's exciting stuff, and there's so many opportunities uh, for value added, of course. Um, I mean, freezing, drying. Uh, Alex is on our staff, and I think he's got some granola and freeze-dried stuff he's been working on. I haven't seen him somewhere out here yet. Um, Valerie's Food Up does have a commissary kitchen in Moscow, so it's fully licensed. So like John Young was able to just say, hey, I'm doing this event, and he pops in there, and it's all, you know, uh, they do make you jump through some hoops and sign some forms. Um, but we try to do that and make it accessible and affordable and it's got great stainless uh, countertops and big Hobart mixers and the ovens and all that type of bit. And we've had uh, quite a few community members, you know, launch or sustain different phases of their business there. Um, and then of course we can always take that product and land it from Durango to Denver Springs Pueblo and Alamosa to Leadville because uh, we have a really wide uh, customer base. Um, and then we can, of course, help connect local foods input. We, we like to say there's always uh, room for just local business in our network, you know, someone that wants to just make a product and um, get it out into the world. And then we also like to look for those producers that are using Colorado products into their value-added manufacturing and then get that product out. And that, that's a really special thing, and I always love to showcase those items. So. Um, so before I became a rancher, I was also a meat cutter. I did whole animal butchery for about two years. And I think for meat producers, uh, wanting to 
create a relationship with someone who's really interested or passionate about added value products is education. Um, there's not a whole lot of meat cutters that don't work in processors that want to come out who have the financial backing to just start a business. Um, and there's not a lot of people going into meat cutting right now. It's not like a real sexy uh, <laughs> craft um, because, you know, your the avenues you can go in are kind of bleak for most. Um, so I think for producers to, to help advocate for people to get into meat cutting is really important and to show that it is a craft. It's not just um, a, an avenue for a minority to take and have a really um, terrible work-life balance because that's what most of it is. Um, I also think there could be really great relationships between um, added value producers and ranchers within just education itself with different cuts and what producers have a hard time selling. You know, if they are doing any sort of uh, direct marketing, there are still cuts that people will not touch because they don't know what to do with it. So, and, and I, I think for myself at least, something that um, I feel really lucky to have is that connection between what you can do with meat and what you can do uh, with an animal and how to prepare it and how to tell that story and make it really delicious too. Um, I think that would be really wonderful for any sort of livestock producer. If, if there was more of an education for all producers and people who are interested in maybe doing that added value product um, to kind of come together and collaborate yet again, I think that's a key word here is collaboration between these people who are really passionate about food, about animals, and merging it to create something really delicious for people to eat. Yeah, and this might be a little bit of sort of a, a broader answer to the question, um, but as a friend of mine who recently passed, he was um, the owner of Moxie Bakery. For anyone who's been up in Boulder, he passed away last year. I'm actually headed up to his memorial later today, but he always said community over commodity. And so, um, I mean, I hate the word networking, but really just community, meeting people, introductions. So when people ask me, you know, what can we do to help farmers, I mean, my three questions are buy our product, ideally buy enough to share with someone else, tell people about it, share, right, social media, word of mouth, have a dinner party, whatever, you know, sharing means to you, um, and then making introductions. So Andy was always good at um, what do you need, how can I help you, who can I introduce you to to help with that? So through some of just our connections, having lived in uh, Denver area, um, my husband's from here, the Valley Hooper. Um, but you know, I think I mean I I think of myself as sort of a bridge to the front range and getting to make a lot of connections and introductions, and I love that part about my job. Um, but through just people we've met, we grow potatoes for um, Whole Foods. Valley Roots Food Hub, Elephant Cloud Market, Amy's Organics, Daily Harvest, um, Barton Springs Mill, and a lot of those were through introductions from friends and supporters. So it doesn't necessarily mean you yourselves have to be starting up the potato chip company or the french fry company or the pizza company. I mean, if you do, that's amazing. And we will all try to support you and help you in any way possible. But even sometimes it's just introducing farmers, ranchers, um, to people in those positions that could have a huge impact. I um, had a couple of posts on Instagram and one person reached out to me um, just to uh, a mom in Colorado Springs and within a month introduced me to three different people that started buying our heirloom grain and our potatoes. So just the impact that each of us can have through our amazing community of friends and family can really have a positive impact on each of our ranches and farms. Do you guys see any um, any spaces that we could really um, use more processing. Like I feel like there's a lot of food that's produced here. A lot of it is just immediately exported and it doesn't stick around. And that's because there is a lack of, of processing. And is there any like low hanging fruit that you see that, you know, would be what this is the easiest next step to keep potatoes here or I'm imagining like, gosh, somebody, I wish somebody would be making bone broth. 
you know, with these, these things that most people aren't just buying at the store um, that, are, that would be really helpful to everybody. Yeah, I mean, I would say yes, absolutely. There's so many opportunity, but we, as we all know, it takes time, money, energy. Um, we have a handful of opportunities. I have buyers that are begging me for um, par-cooked potatoes, hash browns, french fries, potato chips. Um, but for us as farmers, I mean, we would love to do it. Uh, we just don't currently have the, uh, the extra time and money to put in a facility. So I would say absolutely there's, there's a need for that. We have the potatoes, we have the oils, we have land, we have buildings. I literally have customers, but again, just it comes down to the time and money. So there's so many amazing opportunities and it comes back to collaborations and uh, community to make it happen. Yeah, I really like that topic because there are so many opportunities here in the Valley that haven't been touched on. And a lot of it is because there might not be the resources, financial or physical. Um, but I always thought that a livestock uh, processing facility would be amazing in the Valley because all of our beef is exported outside of the Valley. None of it is processed locally. It may be raised here locally, but it has to go over to the front range or down into Texas, um, out east even, to be processed. So if we want to keep our foods local, that's an effort that's going to require a lot of resources for us to all kind of come together and try even a dairy. I always thought a dairy would be great in the valley because everything has to be shipped. So if you had like a whole dairy here and then the processing facility for the milk, that would be a huge money market. The only problem from preventing people getting into that is the finances and the resources available. Um, but there are just so many opportunities, like with the potatoes, with all of our commodities produced in the valley. But I think that is a big issue preventing that local production and processing. I also want to bring up that we're losing out on a whole lot of money that other people are making because they're adding value and they're selling that food later. And I, I wish I had the, the right number, but it's something like for every dollar that you're spending on any, any food, the farmer's only making about 20 cents or something. And so if the, those, those producers could be adding a little bit of value or somebody else in the valley could be adding it, we could be keeping more of our money here in this valley. So, yeah, and I wonder, does the audience have any questions? I, I totally want to open this up. If you have any, Mo, yeah. Yeah, so she asked if we, know, if we knew about um, Soil Sangrede Cristo, who I don't, I don't know if they're here or not, but um, they're excellent because they have a revolving loan fund that's community funded and they offer zero interest loans to agricultural businesses um so you know if you just need to buy this implement and you know you can apply to them they'll give you the money and you've got you know you figure out your terms with them but you get to pay that back without having to pay interest on it and they have an excellent um it's like a hundred percent of people repay the loans and it really helps level up for some of these producers that are really, uh, cash is one of the things we saw people are really strapped for. Like the finances is the barrier to move forward in a lot of ways. Are there any other questions? Comments? Okay. Um, well, I'm, okay, so I wanna move on to the, one of the next um, shared goals by the community and the producers was to promote and build upon programs that conserve water. And I'm gonna also combine that with, um, this was a shared goal, but uh, it, it rose to the top by uh, producers, which was also to promote practice, soil conservation practices and soil health. So I'm gonna just kind of mash those together because they're so closely related. So, you know, what technologies and practices are proven effective in conserving our water and soil out here? And I know that, that you can all speak to this. 
Yeah, I guess I'll jump on that. Um, so since I am the district manager of the center in Rio Grande Soil Conservation Districts, and I'm also involved with the Rio Grande Watershed Association for the Valley, which oversees the entire Valley, all counties um, and entities. And there's a lot happening around here to conserve that water, let me tell you. <laughs> so um, I guess from a producer's perspective, there has been a lot of trials going on, um, learning how to grow our crops with less water. Um, so that's an ongoing process that we're partnered with Coors uh, in terms of the rye and barley and how to produce that with less water. Uh, we're also partnered with local potato producers and alfalfa and forage producers as well. Um, a lot of the specific technologies, if we're wanting to touch on that, most of our crops in the valley are grown with pivot irrigation on the north side. Um, which is mostly what my districts are involved in. And those pivot irrigation units, those sprinklers, use a lot of water, whether it's from leakages, um, the nozzles being plugged. There's a lot that goes into it. So what we're working on, um, more so from an agro-technology standpoint, is how do we make those more efficient? So we've been coming out, there's been new technologies with the pivot sprinkler irrigations on the nozzles. Um, there's LEPA systems, which we're, we all live in the valley. It's really windy. Um, but those LEPA um, irrigation nozzles hang down lower to the ground. So that way we're not losing as much water to erosion um, and that wind frustration that we all kind of are involved with. Um, but there's been quite a few different technologies that are slowly coming out that we're not seeing so much in the valley yet. Um, I'm hoping in the next five years that we will. But a lot of it does involve how do we make those sprinklers a little bit more precise? How do we implement that precision agriculture in the valley? Um, yeah, I guess for me, um, Nothing is worse for soil health than bare ground, and you see a lot of that in this valley. And, be, and the reason for that, the reason people don't grow something on these center pivots in the fall or the winter is because there's no incentive to do that. There's nothing that is going to be produced off that ground in the winter that's going to make them any sort of money. And I totally understand that, but at the same time, a lot of our soil is blowing away. <laughs> And it's real, you can see it any day in April if you drive through center, <laughs> it's happening. And uh, the only way to keep that soil on the ground is with some cover. And so for me, I think encouraging farmers, whether that be monetarily or some sort of credit that they would receive for doing that, a water credit or a crop credit, um, is the only way that we're going to see that bare ground get covered. Um, and as, as a livestock producer, um, animals maybe aren't the most efficient, but they're the most effective for soil health. So incorporating animals into your center pivots and using this water really efficiently, um, I think could help everyone with fertilizer use, um, with having to use any sort of mechanized weeding, Animals do that for free, usually. Um, and for a livestock producer, I think we need to change our paradigm around getting paid for that. Um, you know, f depending on how long you can keep an animal there, it really might not make any sort of sense for a livestock producer to truck animals to the center pivot for maybe a month. So we need to really change our, our mindset around what we're receiving when we have animals on the land. Um, I think water holding capacity with animals is pretty amazing. If anyone would ever want to come to San Juan Ranch and see that for themselves, um, it's, it's truly magnificent. And the only other thing I'd like to say is I think soil health is the core to human health. And we are so... <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> we are so deficient in that. Um, we want to take everything that we can from our land, whether it's nutrients, water, uh, animals, whatever it is, and we really need to think about giving back to it and, and how we can heal what we're doing. Um, and I think that's the only way to have a more balanced life for our community as well. Woo!
<laughs> well said, Noel. And um, do I have an hour? Because this could take about we, an we hour. Have, we have an hour. <laughs> no, we do. I have so much. I uh, yeah, just want to talk about with this topic. Um, so we, my father-in-law, took our farm organic in 2005. Um, he was a biology major and really just started to see the lack of sustainability and just how every year he was looking around and seeing just more and more inputs, you know, more fungicides, more pesticides, more herbicides, um, and really started to observe that, uh, thank God. So really, you know, early 2000s, uh, went to an Acres conference, used his biology background, saw what he was seeing on, you know, the fourth generation farm and was like, well, there has to be something different. We need to be working with mother nature instead of against it. So um, yeah, really pioneered the way, you know, in organic farming in the valley. 1% of farms in the country are organic. Um, and then when my husband and I moved down, my husband was a biochem major, we went to more of a regenerative approach. So as Noel mentioned, you know, if some of you are familiar with the regenerative term, some of the pillars are incorporating animals into your land. So we now get to work, um, speaking of, you know, collaboration, we get to work with San Juan Ranch and they graze their cows on our land. Um, so animals is one. Um, having a living root in your soil for as long as possible. Uh, crop rotations. So as potato farmers, the average rotation is an every other year rotation. Potatoes, barley, potatoes, barley. Unfortunately, potatoes and barley use about 24 inches of water. And there's no such thing as a no-till potato because when you harvest a potato, we all know you're tilling the soil. So for us, our farm is now on a four to six year rotation. So if we plant potatoes in one section of acreage, we're not planting it back in that area for four to six years to really let the soil um, heal and restore. Uh, we also are really working on finding crops that can also be cash crops when we're not growing potatoes. I think one thing that's hard in ag is that uh, the farmers get blamed a lot, right? Well, why aren't you growing Kernza? Why aren't you growing millet? Why aren't you growing all of these things, you know, that are using less water? Well, do you want to buy it? Do you have a customer for me? How much do you want to pay for that? Oh, you don't? Okay. Well, then why would I plant it? Because that's our livelihood. Um, so, you know, sort of blaming the conventional russet potato farmers um, really isn't you know, the right approach. They're trying to make a living for their families and doing what they've been taught to do, do and doing the best that they can. So for us, we've really had to sort of reroute our thinking and help create the markets first. So for example, we grow 20 varieties of potatoes and one of them is our, you know, we do our little medley potatoes, which are now available as of an hour ago at the Elephant Cloud Market. Michelle's right over there. Thank you, Michelle, for your support. So we grow the little baby potatoes and the beauty with those is we're bringing back the flavor, the color, nutrition to potatoes. They also use half the amount of water because they're little, so we get to harvest them a lot sooner. They take a lot less out of the soil um, and they taste amazing. And we grow purples and reds and pinks and yellows. So they're again, more nutritious, a lot of vitamins and minerals. Um, and you can show your support and help save water by buying that instead of buying the conventional russet. As Nick, you know, is often heard saying, we have three votes a day, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. If you want to buy products that use less water, buy those products and don't buy the products that use a lot more water. And as we see the market decline, possibly with conventional russets, then people will stop growing as many and that use a lot of water. Um, so those are a few of the sort of initial thoughts on water. Um, we're working on a rock certification, if you're familiar with that. So it's sort of the new, there's pros and cons with it, but it's regenerative organic certified. It's a little bit tough because it's now the 1% of the 1%. So if 1% of farms are organic, 1% of those farms are also regenerative. But as we know, not all you know organic farms are apples to apples, and we're really trying to do it differently and really incorporate animals and really take care of our soil. So we're already farming regeneratively, and this is a way for us to be certified to actually get paid a little bit more 
or to possibly work with some additional customers that would now buy our potatoes at a fair price because we're regenerative organic. So Amy's Organics that I mentioned earlier, Daily Harvest, also um, they're buying millet from us. And these are some huge companies with huge buying power that really are looking at beyond organic and really looking at you know the climate so I think buying, you know, sort of from companies that aren't just sort of greenwashing or, you know, talking the talk, but really buying from local farms, trying to farm the right way, use less water, have less of a negative impact on the soil, and continue on the fifth generation family farm. Um, that is how you can support and help save water and help save the climate. So I want to ask real quick, though. Yeah. Why is it working for you and why aren't all the other potato farmers and cattle ranches in the valley doing the same thing? They don't have <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> ah, uh, my husband would say because um, luckily we met and I love the telling the story. I love this, you know, the sales and marketing of it. So for us, you know, we're able to find, sort of find the customers or find the products that they want us to grow and then we go out and grow it. So, you know, it essentially is, um, you know, it's a whole job for me that I do and I love to do it. So kind of back to that, how can you get involved in, uh, involved in farming? Um, you know, tell the story, spread the word. If you do have a background in sales and marketing, maybe work for a farm and help them spread the word and do the part or make the introduction. Um, yeah, so really just, I guess, changing our path, you know, and it, it's hard. Um, we all know how hard it can be to change, especially when you have that many generations sort of behind you or it's always been done this way. But luckily, we are now year seven, my husband and I living down here. The farm is able to support us. Um, and, uh, but it's taken a lot of time and a lot of you know, work and a lot of energy, but it's also so rewarding. So it, it can be done. I mean, anyone can do it. It just it takes you know, innovation and time and energy and passion. I want the story of the San Juan Ranch and the Jones Farm to be the story of the San Luis Valley, right? <laughs> okay, Nick. <laughs> yeah, I, uh, the soil health thing and regenerative agriculture is really intriguing. Um, we've been doing a series of farm tours. We have one more coming up uh, September 29th where we'll be going to Jones Farms and we go to Rocky Farms, which is also one of our valleys, states, and nations, most innovative uh, regenerative soil farmers. Um, and then we go to uh, Gosar and Mountain Mama Milling, Lazy U2 Bar Goat Dairy and all that. And we get buses. It's a really good time. And to see what these guys are doing on that four to six year rotation, to see what's going on on that acreage when it's not your primary cash crop is uh, really astounding. Uh, how much energy, you know, water, inputs, uh, animals. I mean, a lot of care goes into it to get one year of crop out of it. And it's, it's really remarkable. And so it, uh, it brings it home to buy the products and invest your money in this, these ways. Yeah. Uh, it's valleyrootsfoodhub.com. You can uh, reserve a ticket September 29th. Yes. Yeah, and just to add a little bit to that from the soil conservation side and kind of going back to answering that question, why aren't all producers doing this? Why aren't they all trying to save water? And I mean, they all are, just not quite to the extent like the Joneswood or Rocky Farms. It's scary. Um, if you don't know how to do something, if you've never done it before, this is your livelihood. It can be really terrifying if you don't know if you're gonna make the same amount of money the next year, if you're gonna be able to keep producing afterward. If you have a hard year and maybe you tried something different and that could be it for you. Um, but what the soil conservation districts are trying to do is eliminate that fear. Um, so we started rolling out a program this year, the Star Plus program, um, and it's a soil health program <laughs> focused on conserving not only our soil resource, but also our water resource, since those are basically married together. You can't have one without the other um, in terms of health. So that program focus on, focuses on livestock integration, continual living root, um, integrating soil nutrient management, and a bunch of other different concepts of soil conservation and health. 
Um, and we are providing a little bit of financial assistance to those producers as well as soil moisture probes so we can help them monitor how these practices are helping their soil as well as soil tests as well. But we're just asking them to dedicate one field or one part of their pasture or even half of a field so that way they're not putting their whole production system on the line for this to test out at least one new soil conservation practice. So that way they can kind of dip their toe in the water without having to be completely afraid of losing everything or everything going wrong, just to see that they can still produce while focusing on soil and water conservation. It's not that scary, but sometimes they just need some help, education, and support to help them along the way. So, so are there policies or regulations that you've imagined you would love to see um, to, to in, and to incentivize you know the farmers and ranchers to like have better practices no bare ground you shouldn't be allowed to keep your your ground bare um, I think that's one of the biggest reasons we have such a poor quality of soil health um, the other thing I think is kind of interesting you know, there's a lot of incentive for people to retire their water or their land or go into crep, but no animals are allowed on that land, even though something might be growing there. And, you know, how this landscape has evolved is with animals on it. And that's how these grasses have evolved. That's how the soil has evolved. That's the only way to have or to help with water infiltration is the actual impact of foot of an animal and to take that away and to actually not allow people who are trying to do the right thing by maybe retiring water or retiring their land and have something still growing there but you can't have any life on it seems counterintuitive to me um, so I think we need to to kind of shift our mind around taking something completely away and not allowing anything else that might be productive in the actual benefit of soil health in those matters. So those are two things to me that could, could change pretty drastically, pretty quickly. Yeah, <laughs> yeah and a perfect uh, transition to, so I'm currently working on a, I'm calling it the Rye Resurgence Project, because what I'm seeing with all of these, you know, trying to be helpful and in some ways helpful at decreasing water plans, a lot of them by the government, um, is that really at the end of the day, farmers want to farm and they want to make a living for their families and they ideally want to maybe get paid a little bit more. So I essentially am working on scaling up what we're doing. So we have been growing rye as a cover crop. We planted after potato harvest in the fall and somehow it amazingly survives throughout the fall, winter, and spring here in the valley, which as we all know is a miracle. Seeds in general are a miracle, but if they can survive negative 20, negative 30 degree winters in the valley, it's especially a miracle. So rye, luckily, is one of those seeds that survives and grows down here. We actually have a few different varieties that also survive and grow, and we had been planting it since the 80s just as a cover crop, just simply wanting to cover our soil have a blanket over our soil so that it's not fallow land um, all you know fall winter spring which then creates this dust bowl situation that we're starting to see and it's getting worse and worse we're in the heart of it you know in Hooper um, and near center so I started talking to farmers like hey you guys used to grow rye why aren't you growing rye anymore oh well the price doesn't make sense for us so kind of back to putting it always on the farmer, right? Why aren't you planting these things to help save climate? Well, I'm not getting paid for it, so why would I put time, money, energy into that and plant it? So I said, well, how much were you getting paid and what, you know, what dollar amount would you want to get paid that? So for example, they said, oh, well, the green elevator is paying us 30 cents. Uh, we'd be willing to plant it for 40 cents. If, if we could get paid 40 cents a pound, we would plant it. And I was like, yeah, no problem, let's do that. So what I'm working on right now is working with our distillers, millers, bakers that currently buy our rye from us. Ours is certified organic and we have you know, an amazing story to tell. So I'm able to get a little bit of a higher price for it. But for 40 cents a pound, 10 cents more 
they are willing to plant rye as a cover crop to protect their soil, to have a living root in the soil for a year, and then they harvest it and we sell it. So my plan in the next year is to get 10 farmers to plant 60 acres, 30 acres as simply just a cover crop, 30 acres as a cash crop. That will produce approximately 1 million pounds of rye, which might sound scary to some, but it's really not that scary. Um, we as a small farm produce over 4 million pounds of potatoes and about 300,000 pounds of grain every year and we're one of the smallest farms in the valley. So just to put that into perspective. So a million pounds of rye, no problem. And we could essentially prevent the dust bowl overnight by really creating this market and telling the story of rye in the valley. Also the beauty of rye is it's super versatile. So it can be used in whiskey, it can be used in your baking, it's delicious. A lot of people think that rye tastes like caraway seeds because in a lot of traditional New York rye baking and uh, delis, a lot of people think that they don't like rye because it tastes like caraway seed when in fact rye is very neutral. It has a little bit of like a cinnamon flavor, amazing flavor profile with chocolate. So it's incredible to use in brownies, chocolate chip cookies, pancakes, waffles. The possibilities are endless. So go buy some rye at Elephant Cloud Market and uh, we'll help save the valley and prevent the dust bowl and and animals will eat it and graze on it. So it's this beautiful story, but it just created, it just took, you know, thinking of an idea and talking to the farmers and talking to the buyers and we're gonna do it. We're gonna save, we're gonna save the valley. That's awesome. That's awesome. So that's a thing that I, I'm not, I'm not supposed to be getting ahead of myself and like making, having goals to put in our action plan over the next two years, but that program would be one of the things that I would love to see as a goal that the whole Valley adopts as an initiative that we can all get behind and work towards. So anyway, <laughs> making a lot of notes. <laughs> did, you, did anybody else have anything to talk about with water conservation, soil health? Are there questions or comments out there? Yeah. Oh, nice. His bread was made with Sarah's rye. Yeah, it is the consumer's role to choose choose the food you're buying. You can choose who the farmer is that you're getting it from. And you know, there's, there's farmers here. There's, if, and if you don't know any, um, talk to Nick because he works with over a hundred producers around, the, around Colorado and a lot right here in the Valley. So there's a, there's a lot of opportunity and we all actually participate in agriculture every day yeah. because we're all eating food every day. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so he asked if, if anybody here is involved in the Southern Rocky Mountain Agri <laughs> Ag Conference. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so I'm actually on the planning committee for that conference. Um, and I highly encourage everyone here to attend this next year. Um, it's going to be that first week of February there. Um, we've got a lot of interesting stuff coming out involving soil conservation, how to keep the nutrients in the soil, and how to use less water. So we have a lot of simulators coming to that conference this year, a lot of programs to help get producers started and involved with a lot of the technology coming out, and a lot of the programs that are available to those producers. So yeah, that's, I highly encourage everyone to attend. It, it happens in Monta Vista, so it's very accessible to everybody out here. Yeah, and I suspect yeah. you guys present last year and probably often. Yeah. Yeah. Well, one of the other things, one of the other goals here that I want to get into was, um, so 
two of the groups said this. It was the community members and food businesses. This was a high priority for them, was to increase the production, sales, and consumption of locally grown foods. <laughs> like, this is a priority for people. And I have to say that there is an, a perceived and, and actually a real barrier to accessing local food in this valley. There are a few places you can do it. You can get online and shop at the Valley Roots Food Hub and obviously buy um, a lot of local food or at the Elephant Cloud right here in Crestone. And Michelle, I would love it if you want to be any part of this conversation. Um, and Simple Foods in Del Norte has some local food, but otherwise it's, it's difficult to find it here. In the mercantile. And the mercantile right here. And Ophia. And Ophia's in Crestone. But for groceries, you know, groceries are hard. And, and unfortunately, Alamosa is a really difficult place. And there's some boutique places. But anyway, yeah, I want to know, you know, how we can shore up this gap. We produce some amazing food here. And how can we keep more of it here? Yeah, so I think those locations are a great start, and we have a great start, and we have a you know really diverse online market uh, for folks at home plus wholesaling. Yes, thank you, Cindy, and we've got a lot of great customer support in that way, which is uh, what we've been bred on for the last eight years, and it's a great base. Um, I did wanted to bring up one thing, and this might be a parting thing, but when Jay's talking about sovereignty and you know resiliency of the food system. And um, hats off to the USDA. Uh, it's an amazing, ginormous federal organization. And I know the people with the boots on the ground are doing a, an amazing job and their hearts are in the right place. But there's a lot of money being infused in the local food system. And it's a great thing. We're all taking it. It's uh, helping us build. It's helping us scale. It's helping us get food into schools and all that stuff. But I just want to remind us that as we scale and as we build out and we build out staff and warehouses and refrigeration and trucking capacity, if that money all of a sudden is gone and we don't have the local consumer dollars putting into that system, we're going to be, I mean, that's how you kill businesses. That, that's will, uh, so not, not to be all... Uh, you know, that side of the spectrum. But I just wanted to bring it up that it's really going to be about local people putting their local dollars. And I know it's hard-earned dollars. And I know the local proposition is more expensive. Um, however, that is what we're talking about because it's so much more than just cooking dinner at night. It's about saving the soils of the valley and saving our water and our future and all this stuff. So it is breakfast, lunch, and dinner 365 days a year. Um, so. Uh, you know, again, this local money and getting free food from these federal programs, you know, is great and stuff. But just remember that we got to put our hard-earned dollars into these people and into these systems. So I've been here for about um, three and a half years at this ranch. And I would say about two years ago, uh, we had Crestone Food Bank reach out to us. They had received USDA money through a grant and they wanted to buy whole animals from us to bring to the food bank and distribute to everyone here. And that was what not only myself, but my bosses, their core value is feeding the valley. I mean, it, it's really easy to go find, you know, someone who's gonna pay outside of this valley the price that you need but we really wanted the, the food to stay here and feed our community. And that, to us, made the most sense in the world. So I agree with Nick. That money is going to go away eventually. But we need to, as a community, con continue to support one another and support keeping our food here, because that's what your producers want to do as well. Um, and with this new bill for local schools uh, to start buying from local producers, we really need to, to fight for that and make sure that we're supporting the schools to be able to do that, whether it's training or buying equipment or just figuring out how to get a delivery system to, to bring them whatever they need. I mean, that's how we're going to do it. It's, it's wonderful if you can go to Simple Foods and buy all your, your produce locally and all your meat locally. Um, but if we want to keep it in the community, we have to think about our neighbors as well. And right now, this valley is one of the poorest school districts in Colorado. 
and those kids deserve to have local food just as much as we do. Um, and so I think you're spot on, Nick. Um, as a whole, we need to think about the entire valley and how can we support keeping our food here. Because again, as consumers, you have the power to make sure there's dollars available for producers, to make sure there's dollars available for these institutions to buy locally, and make sure that you voice that, that that's really important to you. Because as a producer, you can say, I have the best beef and it's the most nutritional you know, food that you can give to a child, but that's great. But if they can't afford it, they can't afford it. And that's the reality of it. Um, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> So are there, what, what is easy to produce here that we could easily be adding value to that maybe we're not already? You know, we're, we're, that's like another question. Like what's the low hanging fruit? What's, what's gonna be one of the easier things to just add to what's available on the, on the store shelves here? Well, no one's really doing it, but kosher grows everywhere here and really, really well. <laughs> It's probably one of the most thrifty plants in the valley, and there are animals that will eat it. Um, I think we need to rethink the, the proteins that we eat, because yet again, animals were here before we were. They evolved with this landscape, and we can't take them off because we think it's bad for the environment. We need them now more than ever. Um, I would really advocate for people to start growing sheep and goats because they use so much less water and we need to start eating that that's the reality cows are wonderful they're great i love them but we need to start thinking about what what does the land need what makes sense for this land what makes sense for the water we have available and not just what we want to do because we always have done it that way um, i've had this crazy idea of just not planting anything on the half circle we have and just let that kosher grow and graze sheep and hopefully someone will buy it. <laughs> um, and with fire mitigation, goats and sheep are the, the easiest way to make sure that we don't have fires in this valley, which is going to happen. You know, it's happening everywhere. We had a, a fire a couple weeks ago down by South Fork. It's going to happen, but if we can, in a, in a cost-effective way, graze this, this landscape so that we're protecting this valley and everything on the valley floor that's essential, agriculture included, to me that makes a lot of sense. So um, that's my goal, I think. That's, yeah, that's Perfect and uh, totally leads into sort of how to get involved again to the initial question with farming So we you know lambs there used to be a ton of sheep produced in the valley uh, when we first moved down here We did uh, we we tried you know, we did sheep we did chickens. We did turkeys. It was amazing It was beautiful. I was selling uh, chickens at the farmers market in Alamosa So that's another um, that hasn't gotten mentioned yet, you know with all the different markets we have we do have a vibrant Alamosa farm Farmers market on Saturdays. We have a short season, as we all know here. And then on Wednesdays, there's the Mercadillo at the farm park, which is so beautiful and incredible, also. So, you know, additional ways to get fresh local veggies and meat and beans and all of these beautiful things grown here. And they are really available. Um, but back to sort of the animals on the land. So we, you know, sort of each year trialed these different things and it was so fun and beautiful, but so hard. And, you know, when it came to the sales and marketing now and the uh, butchering of all of these animals, we just realized for what we were getting paid and how much work we were putting into it, as well as with our potatoes and grains, we just couldn't continue to do it. So I've, you know, essentially every young person I meet, I just beg them, like if anyone wants to get 
get into learning and wants to get into chickens or wants to do turkeys, we have all of the infrastructure. I mean, we have the fences, we have the land, we have the food, we have all of the processing equipment, we have relationships. I mean, I will even give you my customer list. We just need it to be on our land. We need it to be the regenerative, you know, rotation. So if anyone is interested in trying, you know, want to buy 50 head of lamb, want to get some chickens, you know, we've got the chicken tractors, we've got all of the infrastructure, we just don't have the additional time and energy to do it. So there is so much opportunity in so many ways that we can use what we have and build additional businesses. I mean, there's a ton of chicken farms, Boulder um, Chicken, one of the biggest chicken facilities in Boulder um, closed a couple of years ago. Um, a lot of chicken farmers are closing their doors because because it's so expensive. The way I look at it is back to the collaboration. Like if you're working with a farm and we, you know, maybe do a, a share and we already have the land, so you're not needing to put a ton of money into it. It really can work, but it's all about that collaboration, which is why we work with San Juan Ranch. We don't want to be raising our own cows, working with a processor, selling beef, because we don't have the time and energy for that. So they get to do that, and then we get our cover crop grazed and get all of that healthy nitrogen um, and nutrients in our soil. It's a win-win. Yeah, I think this is a great place for the organiz organization of soil to come in with these interests, you know, zero interest loans for young people, that's a no brainer. I guess it's the education piece. And again, getting back to collaboration, maybe you don't have the equipment or the infrastructure or the tractor or any of this stuff. But if, if you're able to start with a zero interest loan and someone who can teach you how to use those things, um, I think it, it's a no brainer. And also, I mean, I think, again, we need to change our mind about, in most of those cases, I guess, you know, depending, if you're really interested in having animals there, you might not have the producer pay. But most times, who's ever landed in wants to get paid a lease for that. And we need to change our mind about what is what are those animals actually doing for that land? And in fact, should the producer be paid for bringing those animals to your land? I mean, that has to change. If a producer has to pay to, to truck their animals there, to create infrastructure, to, to do all this stuff, it's really a, a zero gain sum for them. And not a lot of producers want to put all that energy and work into that. It's a lot of energy and work. Um, so we need to change our mind. If we want a better valley, if we want soil health, if we, if we want all these things, we have to change in, in the way in which we see these land management companies and, and what they're actually doing for the, the prosperity of the land. Absolutely. Yeah, so for people that couldn't hear that, he was just emphasizing or maybe encouraging us to reword, you know, feeding the soil, um, growing, yeah, building the soil, growing the soil by doing these practices. Um, and, you know, and, um, you know, back to sort of teaching the neighbors, you know, that that is really an important reminder. Um, I know that our neighbors that aren't necessarily doing these practices are watching us. You know, we are being watched. They're they're watching to see if we're going to be successful, if we are going to make it, if we're sort of just talking this talk and then we go bankrupt next year, then of course they're not going to want to do that. So, you know, the, people are looking over the fence, watching what, you know, George is 
doing and and we're um but also a reminder you know we live in a community of you know multi-generations of friends and family and we all go to the same schools and we all work together and so also really trying to have a message of kindness and respect and love is important you know it's like this is the way we're doing it and this is working for us and this is what we've chosen to do and maybe here's our why um, but not you know criticizing and not having judgment and you're using more water and we're not it, it can be really challenging and i've really had a heavy weight on my shoulders especially over the last year with how i word it and how i act and just such a reminder of being you know respectful and kind and uh, pioneering the way with light and love um, because whenever we throw stones or we're critical they're never going to want to do what you're doing if that's how you're acting so yeah Yep, and that's the plan with the Rye Resurgence Project is really we're going to be focused on the Hooper area to start. And ideally, when we're in a brownout situation and people are driving through Hooper down Highway 112 and Highway 17, and all of a sudden the, the air clears up and you can see in front of you and they're like, what's happening here? Why is, you know, why is this not a brownout situation? Then we're spreading the word about Rye, the benefits of Rye one uh, driver, one seat at a time. Not to interrupt you guys, but if we do have questions, we'd love for you to be available on the live stream because people won't be able to hear you. So just let me know as you guys and Jay would like to do this, we can pass the mic around, okay? So I just, I, I wanna ask too, if you guys know of, or, or have imagined any opportunities that are there or, or needs that we have for more producer and food business collaboration. And you know, it sounds like the Valley Roots Food Hub has an incubator kitchen, but I'm wondering, is it maxed out? Is it available? Do we need more incubator kitchens? Do we, we need more um, outlets for food to be sold? So. Um, yes to all of it. Um, the kitchen is actually remarkably open at the minute, and that doesn't always happen. And you can't get too many people in there because kitchen people, you know, they're a little territorial. And so, and also, if you're running a business, you kind of need the space and you need the whole shebang. So you can't like really get packed too many people in there. So we do uh, have an opening at the minute. Yes, we do need outlets for more. Um, I'd like to see more restaurants plug into the system, um, and you know, food trucks like John Young. Please go see his pizza outfit and. Um, yes, absolutely. And I'll just add, you know, kind of back to the restaurant thing. It, it is, I struggle living down here when it comes to restaurants. You know, we, we have so much incredible food around us. And then there's so few restaurants specifically in Alamosa, you know, that you can go to and really eat a lot of that local food. So I guess just back back to the vote, right? Like when you are eating out at those restaurants, you are voting for that food and where that food comes from. And so just really being mindful of that and really trying to support and encourage the people that are, you know, maybe spending more money trying to buy local, buying from the food hub, as opposed to, you know, all of the Cisco's and Sham rocks driving in and out um, that matters when you eat there you're voting for that restaurant and that food and be, be you know being thinking about that yeah I, I think that we really need to be asking and encouraging our local bakeries cafes and restaurants to carry local food ask them what on your menu is local because that's what I want to eat and if we don't bring it up, they're not going to make the effort necessarily. So it's really up to the consumers, who are all of us. Um, and we only have a little bit of time, just a few minutes left. So I, I want to, you know, any last questions, comments for a panelist? Kim, there's a question. I'm pretty new to the valley here. Is there any connections to the university system or the school systems to help 
with whatever so you're talking about education for young people so that it's part of the cro programming integrated into the school systems both k-12 or adam state or anything so you're getting this the education out there and then a connection in all of the areas that you guys work in yeah, so I can speak on the university level. Um, I was a master's student at Adams State, so I did all of my um, higher level education at Adams State. And when I started about six years ago, they had just implemented an agriculture and food degree paths that are focused on um, sustainable regenerative food production and agriculture production. Um, so from that level, there definitely is some education showing um, more interest in these pro uh, programs at Adams State. And I've noticed a lot of the local high schools, not so much the elementary schools, but I mean, they're all usually K through 12. A lot of them are also supporting these kinds of programs through their FFA, through 4-H programs, um, through a lot of those after school, in school programs as well. Yeah, definitely. So we do integrate a lot of students into the businesses as well. Um, more so at a collegiate level, a lot of our, um, actually Adam State just got a USDA Next Gen grant for that purpose. Um, so that way they can provide internships and partnerships with local producers for the agriculture and food students um, to kind of get out there and learn more about production and how to get involved after they're done with their, um, their degree path. Yeah, um, some people may not know, at universities and stuff, it's not like Adam State runs the food program as far as feeding the students. There's uh, these huge contracting companies that come in. Uh, Adam State has Sodexo. There's another one called Bon Appetit that operates at uh, different campuses. Um, and so these businesses are there to make money, period. Um, so they're a little tough to work with. There's, a, uh, there's some barriers. However, Colorado did pass Proposition F. Is that what it's called? Um, yes, it will be going to effect this year, and that is to get K to 12 schools to be ordering local. And there's also funding for uh, pots and pans and infrastructure as well. So there's good things at the Colorado state level happening for K to 12. Yeah, I got one. I want to. I want to. I want to follow up though with your question um, that there is also, as far as like education, uh, Local Foods Coalition has multiple programs. One of them is the Rio Grande Farm Park at the corner of 160 and 17 in Alamosa. And they have a high school internship program called the Rising Stewards Program, which is super cool. It happens all summer. So that's something. And CSU also has an extension office, which has um, various kinds of like food preservation education and different things that adults can participate in. So there is there are some things, um, but yeah, getting local food into the schools and is a whole nother ball game. I think it'd be really interesting, and I don't know, there seems like there's people here that can maybe chew on this and think about it. I think having a producer and chef or whatever you want to call them kind of fair or education um, event that people can meet one another within the valley who are producing food and also cooking the food, um, especially with this new, uh, within the K-12 system. I think there needs to be more of a connection between the people who grow our food and who are cooking it here and creating those, those connections and networks. So I think something like that could be really beneficial for people who are working within these kitchens at the schools who maybe have concerns or challenges and letting producers and other people hear those things I think would be really helpful because yet again as a community we need to support one another in order for these changes to happen. Yeah, I think that would be an incredible event, like maybe a roundtable um, at the Ag Conference every year in Monty. 
Um, I mean, that's how we got connected with Boulder Valley School District. We were um, up at the Colorado Fruit and Vegetable Growers Association, and they have a speed dating session for producers and buyers. And Boulder Valley School District buyer was like, oh, do you grow potatoes? We need potatoes. And 30 days later, we were sending up pallets of potatoes to them. So it doesn't take a ton of effort, but that would actually be a really cool session at the ag event. Uh, to just invite all of the chefs, all of the buyers at every restaurant, every grocery store, um, and then have, you know, Nick there and some producers and just doing that face to face and getting deals, getting POs, selling, <laughs> selling veggies and meat. Easy, easy, easy. But we have another question from Zach. Cool. Thank you. Yeah, um, so, um, so there's a lot of amazing science about water like water with the molecules uh, away more okay so like water molecules can um right here oh you, closer oh how oh uh okay water molecules can lose their charge and scientifically speaking it's called dead water especially in the cities when you get it out of the faucet it's not it loses the water molecule water molecules lose their charge and i've heard of some farmers using structured water and getting better results with their um you, you losing less water because when the water is structured it absorbs better in our bodies especially when we get older but also um with plant life and farms and stuff when it's structured it absorbs into um, their crops a lot better so they use less water and i've heard of people growing with uh, strawberries and some other things but uh, they've significantly reduced their uh, water usage and so i was just wondering asking if about using structured water and farming and i don't yeah. know do, can anybody speak to that here Yeah, I'm, I'm not familiar with that. My father-in-law or husband might, you know, with the science background. Um, I mean, one example, we do worm composting and make worm tea, but I'm not, I don't, I'm personally not familiar with the differences and we don't use that as far as I know, and I'm not sure if people do, but that could be a great, you know, maybe question for um, CSU extension that's really involved in the valley and in farming and they're a big part of the ag conference also so if you have you know research or studies that you've done or you could ask them um, if they're familiar with that and then maybe you know see if you could do a class or talk about it at the ag conference to educate people on that very thing could be really impactful there's a lot of farmers and ranchers that are at that event. It's kind of the who's who in ag world. So if anyone wants to get tied into ag world, that's the event to do it. Okay, well, thank you all so much. Um, if, if, if this was an exciting conversation for you and you're interested in these kinds of topics and, and questions we were asking, we are very much looking for community participation in the food and agricultural action plan that we are gonna be working on for the next two years. So if you want any information about that, come see me right after this, this talk. And also, um, I don't know if, so these were supposed to get passed out. We are also conducting a photo voice project over the next several years. So please submit your photos. Get one of these flyers from me if you don't have one. We would love to see what food and agriculture looks like to you because we want this to be a very community driven and inclusive process. It is not just the people up here who are gonna be making the, the decisions about what the goals are. It is you guys out there. So thank you all for participating. Have a great day.